Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Dr. Diva Nagula. He's an author, a physician, and uh, he's a stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma survivor, which is a very big deal. So we're going to talk about uh, cancer. And uh, Dr. Diva, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, sorry you got to uh, that point with uh, you know, the lymphoma. Would you be okay to start with uh, talking about your experience there? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, anything, anything specific you'd like me to address? Because I could go on for, for hours talking about it. Well, I mean... Um, were you a doctor at that time that you had oh, it? Yeah. Like, like, when did you get it? What was the context? And, you know, if you fast forward to the end, how has it changed your outlook on what you do today? Yeah, all good questions. Uh, so when I was first diagnosed, um, it was in uh, 2000, it was February of 2014. And I had actually literally just about a year prior, I had exited my practice. I was uh, in, practicing interventional pain management. Uh, for about seven and a half to eight years. And it was a really busy practice with a lot of stress. Um, I was managing, uh, you know, started it from the ground up and, and you, I had 30 plus employees by the end of the seven and a half to eight years. And I uh, was managing the patients on my own, as well as also overseeing the staff and HR and all of this, all the business efforts uh, that include the marketing aspects and it was just really a lot of stress that went, went on in that practice. Um, I actually got burnt out, which is one of the reasons why I, I decided to exit. Um, but about a year later is when I went in for a physician's checkup and just a routine checkup to see my primary care doctor. And at that time, I wasn't really complaining of anything. I was just, I, I was just a routine visit. And uh, incidentally, I was there. I was asking him if he could take a look at some of these uh, skin growths that appear to be on my neck. And I called them growths because it literally was enlarged over a period of two to three weeks. And I mean, I'd felt it before, but uh, I just, I saw it on one side of my neck and then I saw it on the other side of my neck. And I was like, what the heck is this? And it wasn't painful. So I wasn't feeling bad. So and it was to me, it was, it was uh, evident that it was probably some sort of uh, assist that needed to be referred to a dermatologist or some sort of plastic surgeon to get it removed and, and move on. And I'll be able to get on my way. Uh, the physician actually said, you know, let's take a deeper look. And then he thought it was my lymph nodes that were actually enlarged. And he wanted to get uh, a detailed scan of the of the uh, uh, of the neck, and uh, the imaging studies would, would detail uh, what exactly was enlarged and what was going on in that area. So I, I get these scans and come back about three to four weeks later, and um, he was concerned because the scans actually uh, showed that the lymph nodes in the whole region of the neck and parts of the axilla um, were actually extremely enlarged. And uh, to give you a, a little bit of a, a context. Um, lymph nodes typically are about one to two millimeters in size. Uh, my actual lymph nodes at that time had actually grown to be one centimeter in size. And oh, wow. so he, he was really concerned. Um, he was, he was going through what's called a differential diagnosis is basically if there's some sort of symptom, you go through your, uh, a differential diagnosis of what it could possibly be. So you can, it's an array of items. Um, and for me, he was talking, I already knew what, what it could be and we we're both thinking it was inflammation or some sort of infection that was brewing inside me that was going on. And uh, of course, you know, he had to see the C word. He's like, well, we need to rule out cancer also. Um, and the best next thing was to go to an oncologist. And I, I, I was reluctant because I didn't want to go to an oncologist and, and I didn't feel it was necessary since my blood work was normal. Um, I was feeling fine, had tons of energy and I was, I just gotten married and I was ready to really just move forward with my life and, and start a family. That's what I was looking to anticipate doing. So begrudgingly, I went to the oncologist's office and he saw me. He's like, yeah, let's get some tests. So he ran a battery of tests. So I had to get a lymph node biopsy, a bone marrow biopsy, more blood work, um, more scans. 
And then finally I came back to him and about two or three weeks later, he delivered the news that I had non-stage four, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and it was stage four. And it was really a shock to me because I couldn't figure out how in the heck that could happen. And yeah, going, that's horrible. in my mind, I was like, how did I have this? I mean, I don't have, a, I mean, even though I, I was a physician at the time and I am a physician now, it's not like I knew everything about um, uh, uh, cancer and oncology was not my, my practice. And, and so I, we might've grazed it in, in med school and I might've had a little rotation for a few weeks in, in the oncology field, but I didn't know what the cause of, of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma was. I didn't know how to treat it. And this guy was, was a, a private practitioner and he was saying that I needed to start chemotherapy right away. And I was just took it by surprise. And I was like, you know, we, let me just do some research and figure out uh, what is the cause of this and what I can do. If there's any other options besides chemotherapy, I'd like to pursue that. And I, of course, I wanted to get a second opinion. Um, I went to two different physicians at academic institutions. I went to Sloan Kettering up in New York. I went to Mayo Clinic in, in Jacksonville. And um, both were, they said that I didn't have to start chemotherapy right away. And the main reason why was I was fairly young. And secondly, I, I wasn't displaying any symptoms um, other than the enlarged lymph nodes. I wasn't losing, I didn't have to lost weight. Um, I didn't, I wasn't going in, in some sort of organ failure. Um, the lymph nodes weren't enlarged and encroaching on a vital organ, compromising that organ. So it was all, it, for me, it was, it was, I was, it was best course of action to follow what's called a watch and wait period. And a watch and wait is exactly what it is. You're just basically watching to see if, if the cancer actually grows or it regresses. And at that time, I, I dove into the books. I did a lot of research and I was, taught, I was thinking to myself, I'm going to figure out how to regress this. There's got to be a way. And if there is a way, I'm going to look into it and, and, and do it. And so I researched and, and I, I tried a lot of different things, uh, which I'll get into later. But um, about six months into the watch and wait, you know, I was trying, I had changed my diet. I started some supplementation. I restarted some exercise. Um, I, I was just trying everything to, to do. I was also trying to reduce my stress. I wasn't working at the time, so I could implement these strategies and, and figure out what could work, what wouldn't work. Um, and six months into it, I had developed this awful back pain. And um, it was like in my flank area, radiating into my groin. And oh, no. I was thinking to myself, okay, I've diagnosed this a hundred times. It must be some sort of uh, a kidney stone. And the reason why I was thinking that is because cancer cells have a high turnover rate. And when they do, it increases the amount of calcium, which is a composition of, a, of kidney stones. And so I was thinking, okay, this is what's going on. Let me go and call the oncologist. I was supposed to get scans anyway, a week later. Um, but he, he said, let's go ahead and get it now. And when I got the scans, um, it really showed a progression of the disease. The one to two centimeters in size of the enlarged lymph nodes was no longer discernible. You couldn't see the lymph nodes anymore. It kind of coalesced into this huge mass. And the mass was just gigantic. And it was not just one mass, it was just masses. So all the lymph nodes in my body had just grown and they just kind of combined together and formed this huge mass all over my body, my stomach, my kidneys, um, you know, my, my groin area. It was just, just these huge chunks all over the place. And, I have a quick, I have a quick question at this point. Yeah. Um, for people that had your condition, have your condition, uh, what's the, you know, if they get chemo and resect some of the lymph nodes, et cetera, what's the survivability? Well, that's a good question. And, it, and it's, and it, the answer is kind of variable depending on your age bracket, depending on the stage it's in. Um, you know, at the time and when I had, was diagnosed, the, um, they were talking about, you know, there was a 75%, um, uh, survival rate. Um, that was in my age group. You know, if it was actually someone who was older, it would have been a less of a high, that it would have been a much lower percentage. Um, but because it was, and, and this was before chemo, it was even started. So they were pretty um, optimistic that I had some fairly good chances simply because I was young, but the stage four and the spread to my bone marrow and the spread all over didn't really give me chances. So it was all at that time, it was really all about the medicines. So, um, but for me, it, it was a, it was, you know, it was, it was literally, I was, I was scared at the time because of the growth. And then, and then the reason why I was having so much back pain was because the, the lymph nodes was pushing against my kidney. And that's what was causing me to have this discomfort. 
Well, another question here is how did you handle, you changed your diet, you did a lot of things right. For those six months, mentally, what did you do? Because, yeah. you know, the, I'm sure the fear was eating at you constantly. Like, what, what did you do there? You know, and that was the thing. I, I kind of really remained optimistic. Um, I, I felt that this was an opportunity that was given to me by God and that I had an, I had a very good chance because I, have, I had this watch and wait period. I felt that it was my opportunity to really change my lifestyle in a, pro, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a positive way because I had such a poor lifestyle before the diagnosis, which led to the diagnosis of cancer. So I really felt it was, it was an opportunity to change my ways. And then also, um, if by being successful, I could go ahead and teach this, these, these uh, implementation, strategy implementation to my other people. That was my goal. And that was my, my that was taken. So I wasn't really scared. Again, it was more like, I, I'm, this is, I had a goal. I had, I had, this is what I had to accomplish and I needed to do this um, uh, successfully. And that's how I've, I've always been in my life. If I set a target, set a bar, set a bar and raise the bar. I would, you know, I would have to meet it. That was just kind of how I was always raised and, and I grew up and, and, Part of the reason why probably I was always stressed out because I always had to be successful and, and either do things correctly and meet the expectations that I set myself for. Um, so so what, yeah. what happened then once you got yeah. these new scans and it was worse than what? Well, be, yeah, because of the growth and because it was it was encroaching on an organ, um, they, they highly recommended that I start chemotherapy right away. So um, within the next one to two weeks, um, I had start, I, I was enrolled in chemotherapy. Uh, the chemo regimen consisted of uh, one and a half days of infusions per month. And it was a uh, first day was eight hours. And the second day was a four to six hour infusion. Um, and it was monthly. It was going to be six cycles in all. And after the six cycles, they would redo uh, the uh, scans to see where I was, um, if I was in remission or if the cancer needed to be treated with some other medicines. Jeez. That's, um, I've heard of protocols where it's, you know, once or twice a week, but eight hours and then four, that's, it seems intense. What was that? Uh, I don't know if you want to think about it. What was that like? I mean, honestly, the, ke- the, the chemo itself was really not an issue. I mean, it wasn't uncomfortable. It wasn't painful. Um, it, it was, it, it, the medicine took a cumulative effect. It, it just, it did its thing the first day. And then, but over time after each successive uh, treatment, I just felt myself getting weaker and weaker and had no energy. It was extremely lethargic. This particular regimen didn't cause me to lose my hair. Um, and fortunately, you know, the nausea wasn't that bad. I was able to tolerate the nausea. Um, and, but really, it was the fatigue. I remember one day I went to um, go to the mailbox to get the mail. And between my front door and the mailbox, we're talking maybe about 20 yards, uh, maybe less than that. And so I literally walked down there and I, I remember opening the mailbox and I was like, why am I so tired? And I literally had to like take one to two minutes to catch my breath, to get my heart rate to, to slow down um, before I could go make that trek back to the front door. And um, at that time, I, I was, it, it was probably within uh, the second month or maybe the two and a half months into my, my treatment. Um, so I, it was just taking a huge toll on my body. I was sleeping a lot. I mean, the one good thing about it, if you want to call it a good thing, I was sleeping a solid eight to nine hours a day. Um, before that, I, I was not having any type of quality of sleep. Um, you know, when I was working, you know, three hours here, uh, broken sleep, another two hours there. It, it was just horrible. Um, but yeah, that was, that was, that was the, um, uh, the process for me. Um, and uh, um, so, so what, what then? What, what did yeah. you do then? So, um, unfortunately at that, you know, it was during this time where my, um, ex-wife at the time, she essentially, and I decided that our, we were, we were fighting a lot and I was in an emotional turmoil. Um, and my response to the whole thing was to push everybody away. Um, I had pushed family away. I pushed friends away. I was angry and my emotional state was simply of anger because that was the state that allowed me to, um, have enough energy to get through the day. And I didn't have any depression because I, I wouldn't let myself get depressed and feel sad because that would not be something that would allow me to have energy to get through the day, take care of the household stuff, you know, and actually be there, you know, in, in a, as a provider for my, my um, ex-wife and, 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 and the household. So um, anger got me through, but unfortunately, the anger caused me to push away everybody so I ended up being alone because um, my ex-wife, she and I fought a lot and um, she ended up leaving. 
um, during my cycles. And um, I ended up having to drive myself to and from chemo on my own. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was taking a toll in that sense, both mentally and physically. Um, after my fifth month of chemo, my doctor said that um, I, I, I needed to stop chemo because uh, my blood work uh, had shown that my white count um, and my other blood cell count had gotten so low that if I was to get any type of infection, a simple cold or, or a cut that might get infected, it could, it could have killed me. So they had to stop the chemo and um, I didn't have to do the sixth cycle, but I did the five and then they ended up going ahead and did the uh, repeat scans. Um, and fortunately at that time, the repeat scans showed that um, I had no evidence of any cancer. Um, so, um, and I talk about this in my book that um, I, I, I felt I hit rock bottom, not when I first got diagnosed, but when I found out that I actually went into remission. And um, the really? reason being, Why? yeah, the reason being is that I had lived every single day um, with the cancer, you know, and having a relationship with the cancer. And so I pushed everybody away and, and um, cancer was the only thing that I had a relationship with. And then when I found out that I, I, I uh, didn't have cancer anymore, I lost that too. And um, I was happy, of course, that I, I was in remission, but it was a fleeting, fleeting type of happiness because then I was like, what next? Um, because every single day for almost a year, I was living for that cancer, whether to figure out how to kill it, whether to get angry at it. Um, it was it, it and myself were one and we became, you know, a, 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 a we had a relationship. And um, when I found out it was gone, you know, of course, I was ecstatic that I didn't have to deal with it. But then I, I, I was like, what am I going to do next? Um, who am I going to share this news with? You know, what's what's next in, in, in my line of work or, or passion or anything? It was just it was a new sensation because that became the new normal for me. Um, I don't remember what the old normal was like because the whole cancer became the new normal. And it was what I was living for um, and living with every single day of my life. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah, that's interesting. It's strange that you would feel like that, but you know, it is what you felt. So it makes, it makes sense. What, um, then what, 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 what was your progression to today? Well, at that time, it was um, um, I, I was actually I started to get motivated to um, to fight this thing, uh, to figure out how to stay in remission. And um, um, it, it, the spark came when I actually ran into my trainer um, at a parking lot at a grocery store, and he was basically asking me how I was doing, and um, he was asking me if I if my body was ready or if I had to, to go ahead to start working out again, and. Um, it was, it was awesome because at that time, that's what I needed. I needed not only the connection with another human being, I needed the camaraderie of, of a buddy. I also needed to work out and, and, and also get those, uh, feel good endorphins in my body circulating, get out of the depression. I needed to change my body because my body had just become so weak and lethargic and I didn't like the way I was looking. So it was a spark for me and it was, I, I really credit a lot of my changes and my motivation, um, to, to my trainer who I ran into and that workout regimen we used to have and fun together and work out. And, um, that's what sparked my, my, um, my change. Um, that's when I needed to figure out and, and really go into, into more detail and find out every strategy that I needed to, to maintain myself in remission. And, um, uh, I knew it wasn't going to be a one type of strategy. Of course, I used a lot of the strategies that I used before when I was first diagnosed, I did, even though they didn't work, I felt that it was probably because I was um, late in the diagnosis with a stage four, and there was no way to really uh, objectify what I was doing if it was causing me to have a, any impact because I was not getting a weekly CAT scan or a week or weekly blood work. I do feel that it gave me six months. I probably, if I didn't implement those strategies, I probably would have had to start chemotherapy a lot sooner. Um, so yeah, I, that's what I was going to ask you is, is knowing what you know now, do you think you could have staved off chemo for good or no? I, probably not because of the advanced uh, uh, cancer that it was, it was such an advanced stage and it was so widespread. Um, you know, I, I probably would have given it more of a try in, in terms of a different approach rather than really focusing on the diet and the exercise. I would have probably um, been more focusing on um, mindfulness um, and maybe some spiritual growth. 
um, which I later discovered um, were the tools that I needed to uh, employ to make to maintain myself in remission and healthy status. Yeah, well, why would mindfulness and uh, you know spirituality help you? Like, in what ways was it through meditation and just relaxing yourself, or can you yeah. use guided imagery you found to actually help your health? With you know, what are the particulars? Yeah, I mean, in the past, when I when I was in that watch and wait period, I didn't have any of those practices at all. So I didn't practice any mindfulness. I, so I, in a sense, I was still in a fight or flight mode. Um, the fight or flight mode was, okay, I had this cancer, even though I didn't feel I was stressed out. I, I'm subconsciously, I probably was extremely stressed out. Um, the underlying, pr- a lot of my problems that I had was that I was living a life of in fight or flight. I was always in that. That's what got me up in the morning. That's what got me through the day. And it's what got me through cancer. And I didn't know that. Um, um, it wasn't until, you know, maybe a few years ago when I had realized that my body was so accustomed to being in a state of fight or flight, I didn't even know how to breathe from my diaphragm. I was a chest breather. And uh, if you're in a state of fight or flight, if you have a mountain lion that's running down at you, you don't have the time to really react and, diaph- and breathe diaphragmatically because you're in that heightened state of awareness. You start chest breathing because it's more of an efficient way of, and more of a quicker way of breathing. And so that's how I breathe all my life. Um, I feel, and I, I kind of figured out that I was born into this world in a state of fight or flight. And I've never really understood, felt, I never learned the correct way of breathing. And diaphragmatic breathing, um, and, and all, that actually serves two functions. One, if you focus on the breathing, it allows you to be more in the moment. Um, and it, you don't, when you're in the moment, you really don't think about your future. You don't think about the past. You're just focusing on the now. That in itself has a lot of healing uh, properties. Secondly, um, it also reduces your state of fight or flight and puts you into a state of rest or digest. So being in fight or flight is 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 appropriate your 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 body is meant to do that but it's a reaction that you have when it's appropriate when you have a line that's actually running down um running down at you um it's not meant your body's not meant to be in a fight or flight by simply worrying about something that's not um, a a proper way of placing your body under a lot of stress um and chronic stress it has has a bearing on on health chronic disease um, all sorts of issues um, that, that can tail as a result from having a lot of uh, uh, s- stress due to being in fight or flight. So, do you, um, you, you said you see patients now, and if so, do you tell them about your circumstance? Oh yeah, I mean, I preach my. I mean, I you know, I preach about it in my book. I preach about it um, through people who who I, I talk with, um, and that's one of my biggest things now is that I think as a society we are always in a, some sort of fight or flight and don't have a mechanism to combat that. And so that's why I, I really feel people should be engaged in some sort of mindfulness exercise on a regular basis, um, just to be able to get out of that fight or flight state. And there's so many strategies that you can, you can employ. Um, it's really just finding that one strategy that really resonates with you and it, whatever it is, that's what you stick with. And for me, it was breathing exercises. I felt that was the one thing that I, resonated with and i can see the impact um, on my own body almost immediately so that's why i stuck with the mind the breathing exercises for my, for my own purpose well as a doctor though when you tell your patients about your circumstance they probably react to you differently or maybe they know coming in you know i've uh, been to plenty of doctors myself and uh you know i know they can they can't sit there and weep with you but at the same time i don't know they don't seem to uh care too much about uh you know what you know oncologists I've been in front of a few of those too. They don't seem to really care. It's like it happens to you and not them. So I don't know how yeah. this has changed your interaction with patients or if they see that. And, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's all about how you educate and if you educate in the right manner or not. And I, and I really think that as our um, institution and practice of medicine has, has, has to change, um, we're, as physicians, we're more um, inclined to, for practicing traditional medicine. It's all about, you know, placing band-aids over symptoms and not really getting to the root cause of the problem. And that's a fundamental shift that we need to have as, as a medical industry. Um, and that's the conversation that we really need to have and not about the oncologists in terms of how they view about the cancer that I've been diagnosed. Yeah, it's awful, but, and you have to have these people to do, to provide these treatments, but what a bigger question and a bigger conversation is, is how do we prevent this from either happening? And that's all about what um, my book is all about is really, you know, trying to find means to prevent these issues um, to, to really counteract 
the, the major problems that we're having in, si- in society with the high obesity rate, the high chronic disease rate, the, the toxic p- pollutions that we are seeing in our environment, the toxins that are in our food, the personal care products that have a lot of chemicals that all these compound together will, will, is causing the issues that we have in society and, 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 and in terms of our, our, uh, our, our physical and, and, and medical outlook. So when um, patients come to you, what is some of your counsel that is, is common to almost everybody? What kinds of things can people do to improve their situation no matter where they're at? Yeah, so what I typically preach to people is if you really want to change, change something that has the biggest impact, um, the one thing is, is I would, I would, I would counsel them about their diet, um, eliminating processed foods and, and sugary beverages is probably one of the things that could have a huge impact on their overall health, um, switching to a organic based diet, um, so that those two things in of itself, um, eliminates so much garbage that's put into your body. Uh, the processed foods have so much excess calories and saturated fats and, and other chemicals. And then if you're eating foods that are traditional instead of organic, you're putting in a lot of uh, chemicals that are put uh, that are placed on foods from herbicides and pesticides that have a, a, a horrible impact on on our body. And uh, that is a, a main thing that I, I preach to people. And it's it's one of those things that you really have to um, really in, and that's where my example comes in um, when I talk about what happened to me and how I lived my life and I was a physician I didn't learn anything about nutrition in medical school they don't teach us that and I was eating the standard American diet I was going to Chick-fil-A I was going to Subway uh, for lunch and it wasn't and I didn't eat anything green or any kind of vegetables um, you know the last time I ate a, a decent you know a meal was when I was in high school growing up in my in my parents house where my mom was was a, was a phenomenal cook and that's when I had proper nutrition and, and as soon as I left on my own it, it, I, I lost that uh, the, that nutritious value in, in, in meals and um, that's so that's one of the main things that I, I, I really preach um, and then secondarily it's all about how you um, calm your nervous system down you have to have a way of you know, uh, trying to be in the moment um, and, and practice some mindfulness, whether it's, you know, uh, yoga, you know, Tai Chi, Qigong. Um, if that's not something that you're into, then, then something like uh, meditation, uh, breathing exercises. Um, uh, those are some phenomenal ways of really um, calming your nervous system down, uh, being more in the moment um, and, and reducing your state of, of being in fight or flight. So what, um, I don't know, what is your thought going forward? Do you think that things like cancer are going to become more and more predominant? Do you think that there'll be better interventions to help? Like what, where do you see things going over the next few, few years? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, because of the advent of technology, modern, modern medicines, we're, we're seeing actually the uh, deaths from cancer reduce. Um, but, um, and that's, that's the news that, that the media wants to portray. But in actuality, the number of cancer cases is going up. And um, so, yeah, and that's great. The problem is, is that people who have cancer once are at a very high chance, have a high chance of having it again. And if you don't implement proper lifestyle strategies, then a likelihood of having that cancer uh, recur is, is very high. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really important to discuss is that it's really about the lifestyle changes. It's whether you have cancer or not, you know, that's really something that we need to talk about as a society, especially practitioners in, in, in medicine need to have that conversation with folks. When you say people that have cancer have a, a higher likelihood of getting it again, the same cancer or a different cancer? It's, it's, it's the same cancer that can relapse or they can, they're at, they're prone to having another cancer or a chronic disease because the underlying factors that caused the initial cancer was, wasn't corrected. You know, genetics play a small role in cancer. It's typically uh, lifestyle changes, lifestyle strategies, uh, poor lifestyle strategies are, is, is, the, is the leading cause of people getting cancer. I mean, supposedly the numbers are that, uh, I guess, for men in the U.S., it's uh, what is the incidence up to 50 percent? For women, it's 33 yeah. percent. Uh, yeah, I mean it's fairly high. I mean, and it's and it's actually it's growing high in number on a regular basis. And the biggest issue is that obesity is 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 one of the risk factors for many of these cancers. And when you're talking about a population in the U.S. where 70 percent are either overweight or are considered obese, you have a huge problem at our hand. 
Uh, our healthcare system is not sustainable when we have this many number of people that are either uh, obese or overweight. And um, we're going to see instances, incidences of cancer rise um, over the next few years, if not sooner. So how long has it been since you had uh, your non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? How many years has it been? Um, it's been, I was diagnosed in 14, went into remission in 15. So um, it's been five years. Okay. And you're still having regular scans and everything looks good so far? Yeah, everything looks great. So, um, and uh, I, I owe that a lot to um, the continual strategies that I've implemented, um, you know, to keep me uh, healthy. Are you doing more than you did in those first six months in terms oh, of diet? Yeah. Oh gosh. Like, yeah. And, and if so, what is it? Like, what, I mean, what have you done to tweak things? I mean, it, it's it's a constellation of learning learning things. And like I said, you know, earlier that I li- literally about a year ago is when I realized that I was a, a, a chest breather, not a diaphragmatic breather. And so that's a whole t- way of, of, of living my life. I mean, lifestyle in terms of eating, that's continued. I've, st- I've maintained that. I eat about 80% of the time. I'll eat um, healthy and then 20% of the time, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll splurge a little bit. Um, one of the new strategies that I use is that I, I'll do intermittent fasting and I'll also do um, one day of, of 24 hour water fast. Um, and uh, the whole reason behind that is because if there are any cancer cells um, that are brewing and we always have, you know, uh, mutations that are going on. And when these mutations are unchecked, that's when cancer starts to happen. When we give our bodies a little bit of a break from eating, our, our bodies go through what's called autophagy. And that's where our system can actually concentrate on others on something else besides digestion. And one of the things that it'll do is clear out cellular debris, clear out these cells that are in a state of, of mutation, and it gets rid of all that. And that's why I really implement um, something like fasting or intermittent fasting. And so that's part of my routine now where I didn't have that um, in the past when I was learning about diet and strategies like that. Um, So that's one aspect of it. I mean, another aspect of it is is supplementation. I really try to take a lot of supplements um, that help me in terms of boosting my immune system and reduce inflammation. Um, uh, And over the last year, I've taken a lot of strategies to uh, really concentrate on reducing inflammation. It's, inflammation is typically the root cause of all chronic illnesses, chronic disease, including cancer. So, um, you know, I watch what I eat. I pay attention to see how it acts on my body. Um, a lot of times we have, we develop food sensitivities and we don't know this um, because we're not paying attention to our bodies. And one of the biggest things that you can really, uh, how you can be in tune with your bodies and to see if you're in a state of inflammation is looking at the caliber of your stool. And if you're having issues with your GI system, where if you're bloated, having nausea, having heartburn, uh, frequent bowel movements, watery uh, diarrhea, um, constipation, these are all signs of some sort of inflammatory process that's going on. Uh, it could be related to food. It could be related to toxins that's in your environment. So I'm more in tune with my body as a result. So I, I, I've done a lot of uh, food sensitivity testing, and that constantly changes in, in, in terms of what I'm sensitive to. And I avoid those foods because that has a quality of having some sort of inflammatory process in my body. So I'm very in tune with what is, inc- what is causing inflammation because I really want to quell any inflammation um, and that's going on in my body. Um, so I, I am more in tune with it now. Um, and then other strategies that I use now is, is I'm really into um, strategies to keep myself in a keep myself out of fight or flight. And that's really a learning thing. That's a very hard thing because for, you know, 40 some years of being of, of thinking and being in a certain way, it's really hard to change overnight. So it's a constant change. It's constant being awareness of, of my heightened state and why am I in this heightened state and what's causing my, what are the triggers? And I am learning more about myself and, and trying to do more work, um, you know, in a spiritual sense. And I feel that those are all things that can help me um, really calm my nervous system and get out of that fight or flight response. So, okay. What's the best way for people listening that have issues to, uh, to get in contact? You do, you know, telemedicine over the U S or are you in a certain city yeah. and state where people see you? And how do they yeah, get no, stuff? everything is done online. So, um, you can get in touch with me through my website from doctor to patient.com. And, um, you know, you can have, you can have access to, um, be able to purchase my book or listen to my podcast, which I release once a week. Um, or if you'd like to get into a consultation, I'm happy to, um, 
to uh, be do a consult, to do an initial consult. And if it's a match, we can take a little deep dive into your own personal um, uh, symptoms and you know, find out some strategies that might be useful for you to uh, keep out of uh, chronic disease and, and, and cancer. Well, very good. Dr. Angulo, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.